right, so good morning everyone and thank you for getting up super early, this feels very loud, um, to join me. Yes, yeah, 8.30, some of us had a late night, right? Um, so my name is Catlin Tucker and we're gonna talk about the flipped classroom today, flipped instruction, um, and really with a focus on the common core. Um, what's interesting about the flipped classroom and it really in and of itself, Flipping the classroom doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to be any better at teaching the Common Core. So what I want to kind of emphasize today is strategies where we're really flipping and engaging students. Um, and so I'm a ninth and 10th grade English language arts teacher. I teach up in Windsor, California, which is about an hour away. Um, and I do flip my own classroom. So I want to start with a clip. In 1930, they oh, were That's not loud enough. Let me see if I... Okay, um, so I want to start with a clip of like a classic lecture um, as kind of our way to move into the flipped classroom since, you know, whether you're lecturing in person or transferring information via lecture in person or whether it's happening online, um, it, it can be less or more effective. So we'll start with this classic clip. In 1930, the Republican controlled the House of Representatives in an effort to alleviate the effect of the Great Depression. Anyone? 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 The Great Depression. Anyone? 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 The tariff? The Holly Smoot tariff? Which? Anyone raised or lowered? Raise, raise tariffs, tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue from the federal government. Did it work? Did it work? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone, know the, Anyone know the effects? It did not it did work. Not work. In the United States, States sank deeper sank into deeper the into Great Depression. Depression. Today, Today we, have we have a similar debate, debate over, over, this. over this. Anyone know Anyone what this, know is? What this is? Class? Class? Anyone? 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 Anyone seen, Anyone this, seen before? this before? The Laffer. The Laffer. Anyone know what Anyone this, know says? this says? It says, it says that at this that point, this point on, the revenue on the revenue curve, you will get exactly the same amount of revenue. As at this, point, at this point, this is very this is controversial. Very controversial. Does anyone know anyone what Vice President Bush called this in 1980? 1980? Anyone? Anyone? Something, Something D -O 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 economics. economics. Voodoo. Voodoo. Okay, so one of the big criticisms of the flipped classroom is there's that basically if you're shifting lecture online, that basically you're not transforming any paradigm. You're not changing education in a, in a really exciting way just by presenting a lecture online, right? Uh, th if we move this online, it's going to be just as uncaptivating as it is in person. And so there's this argument, like, isn't this just the virtual sage on the stage? So my approach when I talk about flipping and engaging is really to kind of think about how we can combat that criticism and make sure that we're not just keeping students in this role of very passive consumers watching videos online or consuming information online. Um, so for those of you who are kind of wanted more information, links, um, maybe teach math or you teach English, you want to have a sense of what this looks like, um, in lots of my workshops on the flipped classroom, I have uh, a, an actual site that I kind of am continually adding to. So this is a Google shortened URL, and whenever you see kind of one of these goo.gl, it's case sensitive. So whenever you're working with Google um, like docs or presentations, you get these enormous URLs, and all I've done is just shrink that big URL down with the Google shortener. So if you want to make a note of this one, you can kind of dig into that website later. It might be useful, um, might be something that you can kind of reference after today. So it's goo.gl slash the number seven, a small g, small t, capital G, capital W, and capital F. If somebody successfully gets this URL written down or typed into their computer and can post it on our back channel, that would be great. Otherwise, I'll make sure it gets on the back channel at the end of the presentation. And when I say back channel, um, I'm talking about our today's meet. So a lot of you guys, how many people in here are on Twitter? A bunch. Okay, so Twitter is like an enormous back channel. People are having conversations all the time. Um, today's meet is uh, less, you know, it's more of a contained, you can create a back channel tool that lasts for two hours or a week or a year, um, and people can post questions, you guys can share ideas. Um, if I go over something kind of fast, 
I am kind of a fast talker, um, and you want to know more about it, just post a question to the back channel, and I'll make sure that at some point today I get on the back channel, answer your questions, or if you want to know, hey, do you have a great resource for this, I'll be happy to share whatever I have with you. So our today's meet.com slash flip it is for this session, um, and you're welcome to use that as I present um, to just share your ideas, post questions, and use it as a way to have a conversation that's in the background of this presentation. So today's meet.com slash flip it. So as we get into this conversation about the flip classroom, and I know that there's a lot of flip classroom offerings here at uh, Fall Q, I, I just want to make sure we're all on the same page about what the flip classroom is. So the flip classroom is a teaching model or strategy um, where basically the transfer of information, uh, which classically happened in the classroom, is moved online. So in the classroom, typically we have transferred information by lecture or by reading something, and the idea is that you put that online so students can consume it, they can you know, process it at their own rate. So if it's a video, they can pause it, they can rewind it. If I'm a student who is, you know, I feel really strong in this subject, maybe I watch it once and I'm fine. If I'm a student who's really struggling, maybe I have to watch it a couple of times. I need to pause it, I need to slow it down, I need to look up a word that's in this video that I don't understand. So it gives students the luxury to kind of pace their own learning. And then what has classically been assigned for homework, which is the practice phase of learning, right? Kids practice and they do a set of problems, or they practice and they write something. That is actually shifted so that it happens in the physical space of the classroom. The benefit of doing that is that when students are at home and they're practicing, they tend to hit bumps and may, maybe not have support to kind of work through those challenges. So if they have a parent that doesn't speak the language of the work that they're completing, or a parent who works nights, then they might not have someone who can answer questions and problem solve with them. But if you move that practicum into the classroom, then they have the subject area expert, the teacher there, who can an answer questions and problem solve with them. Um, and they also have this beautiful community of classmates who they can collaborate with, they can you know, ask questions of, they can work through problems together. So that's the ben benefit. They are able to kind of consume the information and think about it in their own pace, at their own time, but then the practice phase of learning is shifted to the classroom. And the idea is that that will be more effective for students. Um, one of my kind of, my not pet peeves, but my concerns about the flip classroom is that a lot of flip classrooms, they look kind of like this, right? Professors is actually a really famous professor from MIT. They record their lectures, they post them online, and then students go and watch them and they take notes. And I just wonder how effective that is in terms of students really understanding and retaining that information. Because there's no frame, there's no context, they're not asked to do anything with that information um, except to really watch it and take notes on it. So I'm a big, big advocate for figuring out how we can leverage students' connectivity at home and a variety of web tools to create that frame, to really engage students around the information. So instead of that, that oh my gosh, my clicker is like super happy. Um, instead of that situation where there is no frame or context, I really advocate for teachers thinking about how can we wrap that information in meaningful engagement. So here's an example of actually one of the kind of few humanities videos that's offered through the Khan Academy. And it's a video all about the French invasion of Russia. And I was working with a history, per, um, kind of my, my core teacher, I work in a core with a science teacher and history teacher, and I was working with the history teacher, um, and he pulled this video, he really wanted to use it, and I said, okay, well let's wrap it in an online discussion. So students are gonna watch this video, which is about 16 and a half minutes, and then they have to engage in a debate. And the debate asks them, do you think Napoleon could have been successful or could have won the Peninsular Campaign if he had more men? If it had been a different time of year, if he had diff used different strategies, different weapons. So all of a the sudden, there's a shift that's happening. So they're, they're watching the video, they're probably taking notes on it, just like in the classic kind of approach to a flip, but then they also have to demonstrate higher order thinking. They have to evaluate what they've seen so that they can engage in this debate. And when they're debating, they are also doing a piece of argument writing, right? So in the Common Core, one of the, the two kind of 
most common um, or points of emphasis in terms of writing or argument writing and informational writing. So if they have to debate this topic, they have to make a clear claim and they have to support it with evidence. So all of a sudden they're analyzing what they've seen, they're evaluating it, they're writing a piece of argument writing, and then in an online discussion, students are hopefully engaging with each other, replying to each other, asking each other questions, building on ideas shared. So in my, my mind, they're gonna take a lot more from watching this video if it's wrapped in an interesting debate or some kind of engagement where they're asked to really think and demonstrate those higher order thinking skills. And for me, the benefit, really the, the reason I even started exploring the flipped classroom was just time. As a teacher, the biggest challenge for me is I want to do so many things with my kids and I just don't have enough time. So shifting some of that transfer of knowledge online has really created a lot more time for me to get my students kind of working hands on, working together. Because ultimately, I'm always trying to shift the flow of information from kind of this classic teaching paradigm where the information flows from teacher to student, you know, the teacher is the sole source of information in a classroom, and I'm trying to create this like learning community where students are asking students, students are asking teacher, the teachers, you know, asking questions of students. We're all kind of in this learning engagement together. So I'm trying to shift this flow because ultimately what I want my classroom to be is a very student-centered experience. And that's hard to do if you're at the front of the room, you're talking at students a lot or you're, you're trying to give them a lot of information, or you're presenting information. Um, and I love this picture. So th this is Mike, Mike, Mike. Mike with his hand on his head, right? And I like this picture because student-centered classroom is not easy, right? It's so much easier for students to sit back and just let information wash over them, right? They don't have to answer, woo! There's a hole in the stage. Um, they don't have to, there's, there's some over there too. I hope I don't fall on one. Um, it's so much easier just to listen to a teacher, kind of tune out, relax, right? It's so much harder if students have to question, if they have to research, if they have to talk and collaborate and problem solve and create things together. And as a teacher, I think we need to be honest too. It's a lot easier to just kind of stand up in front of kids and tell them everything we know about a topic that we've been teaching for however many years than it is to design really dynamic learning opportunities. So it's kind of a shift in the way we plan for and execute lessons that I think um, is important to acknowledge. So in my class, I'm always trying to create scenes like this where kids are facing each other, they're working together. So I thought it would be interesting, just a little experiment, if you will, um, to see how much you retained from that little clip uh, from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which how many, how many people have seen that clip more than one time? More than three times? Okay, well then you should be expert. Okay, so we're gonna, whatever device you have, it works great on a laptop, a computer, an iPad, I want you to go to m.socrative or Socrative, I'm not really sure how you say that properly, um, and .com. I use this with my students all the time. My room number is 44701. And I'm actually gonna launch this little quiz from my phone just the way I would if I was doing this with my students. So I'll, I'll actually get out of your way so you can see the URL. And Socrative is free, and I can get at least 50 of you into this virtual room. So hopefully most people will be able to participate. How many people felt a little bit of anxiety when I said we're gonna have a little quiz from that? Oh yeah, right? Um, so thinking about what our students experience when uh, if we're doing a flipped lesson and then they come into class and we kind of slam them with a quiz if we haven't asked them to do anything else with that information. All right, oh, there's 46 of you in my room. So I've just launched that quiz. And what's nice is when kids are taking quizzes or they're doing, you know, kind of reviews and I'm using Socrative, I can see the live results. So I can actually see who you are, where you are in the quiz, how, how well you're doing on this quiz. <clears throat> So it's kind of a nice immediate assessment for me as an educator. No cheating. 
Oh, I can't Google these. <laughs> this is for a grade. And it's nice because you can build in also the um, correct answer so students immediately see if it's a multiple choice and you've designated a correct answer, whether it, they got it right or not. Oh wow, a lot of us falling in the threes, three out of five zone. I'm not seeing, not seeing a five out of five yet. I'll give you about 30 more seconds. And in my classroom, I don't have, oh, Jake. Where's Jake in the audience? Uh-oh. Five out of five. Well done, unless you're Googling. All right, um, <clears throat> so I use this with my students all the time. It says, it's, it says you can only get 50, or it's, you're only supposed to have 50 people in your room for the free account, but there's 62 of you in here right now and it's working fine, so. All right, I'll let you guys finish that. So again, I just use that as kind of a fun example to think about, um, okay, if I had asked you to have a conversation about the details of that, that particular clip, or if I had engaged you in some way around it, you might have remembered more of the details instead of you know, focusing on how funny the kids' faces are when they're just kind of staring at him. So thinking about how can we build in engagement to complement what we're doing with the flipped classroom. Um, and I also think it's worth just kind of debunking the myth that the only thing that you can flip in a flipped classroom model is videos. They, I think that there's lots of different kinds of media that we can flip that's worth exploring. Um, you know, when you think about readings, whether it's, you know, primary, secondary sources. So for history, there's a big push for students to be reading primary and secondary resources. Um, in English, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to pull in more informational text to complement the literature that we're reading. And a lot of those informational texts are digital texts that I'm linking out to and having students read outside of class. Um, but there's definitely a transfer of information that happens via the written word. And the Common Core really stresses that students build content knowledge via reading. Um, and so that's an important kind of flip to talk about. So I do often flip my classroom with uh, online resources. The Library of Congress, loc.gov, is a fabulous resource for um, grabbing really interesting um, historical pieces. There's old newspapers, there's cool prints and um, photography. Uh, there's lots of things. I, I was actually doing, uh, we're reading Of Mice and Men, and we're talking about the Dust Bowl and um, the Great Depression, and I pulled a series of pictures from the Library of Congress, just to really bring the, um, the reality of what it looked like, and then they read articles. Um, so there's all kinds of cool stuff that you can grab from there. Um, but when we think about flipping with reading, I, I really like to, oh my gosh, I really like to emphasize, okay, so we're not just sending them home with an article and saying, read this, come to class prepared. We want to engage them. We want them to do something with the reading. We want them to actively read. So one of my favorite uh, tools is Digo, but my students, when we're reading a text, they still annotate. This is actually a picture of one of my students' books at the end of um, the reading, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, and she has all these annotations everywhere. But so much of what they read now is actually online. And as a teacher who's shifting to the Common Core and introducing all those informational texts, you know, I have teachers in my English department who say things like, well, if we have to read, uh, you know, all these informational texts, we're gonna need an, an anthology. And I'm like, eh, I don't need an anthology, right? I don't need an $80 anthology where I might use one, two, maybe three pieces out of it. Instead, I'm just gonna use the internet uh, to find really great resources that are gonna complement what I'm doing with my students right now. And so Digo allows me to get my students annotating the online pieces. So how many people in here have used Digo? Oh, quite a few, good. Um, students can start an account, there's even an educator account, and basically what happens is when kids sign up for a Digo account, and I always recommend that they you know, upload the little Digo icon to their toolbar or their, um, 
next to their URL on their computer. They can basically dego any article they read. They can highlight key information, they can pull over post-it notes, ask questions, and do some of the active annotation strategies that we talk about in the classroom. Um, and then they can share it with me virtually too. So it kind of, it takes the way the need for me to make a ton of copies, pass them out, have kids annotate the copies, collect the copies, grade the copies, get the copies back. Like so much of my life used to be consumed by this paper trail, um, and now it's so freeing to have them do things online and, and learn how to actively engage with a digital text and then share it with me digitally so I can see what they're doing, what they're pulling out. Um, this is an example of an article I had students digo. It's called Why Chinese Mothers Are Superior. And they read it while they were doing, we were doing the Joy Luck Club. Um, and so they were kind of analyzing um, some of the similarities, the differences between the mother's approach in the, in the novel and kind of this, this excerpt from the Tiger Mother book. So Digo is a great way to get them engaging with text outside of class. Um, I'm a Google certified teacher. I love Google apps. All of my kids at the beginning of the school year start a Gmail account um, and so they have access to all of the Google apps. And so one of the things I've started doing um, is really for those more complex texts, the texts that are really meaty, they're hard, maybe some of the language is um, kind of antiquated and challenging for students, is I create a document and I just put in two columns. And in the left column there, I just copy and paste whatever the text is that I want them to read. Um, so this is an example of actually one of the exemplar texts from Common Core, Washington's Farewell Address. And I even link to where they can find it online. And I copy and paste it into this document. It's a view only document. So then I have a group of students who will be discussing, kind of actively annotating this piece together. And what I do is I have the group leader at the, the table group, they make a copy of the document, they share it with the rest of their group, and then all four or five students get on this document, they can use the define tool, they can research stuff that they don't understand or they don't know about, and they can make notes in the right-hand column here. And whenever I have multiple students on a Google Doc kind of digesting a text or talking about it or annotating it, I always say, you know, choose a color, write in that color, everything that you contribute should be in that color, just so visually I can see who's adding what. And then what's nice about Google Docs is I can go up to file, hit revision history, and I can see every single time a student got on that document what they added to it, I can restore previous versions. So that's another strategy for getting them to read more actively. I also use an online discussion space called Collaborize Classroom where all of my students engage. This is supposed to be a screencast, but it's not moving. Um, and what I do is I embed text right into the discussion, which I was hoping you would be able to see, but it's not scrolling. Um, and so I, I put in documents as an attachment, and then students get to read them, have conversations about them, talk about the things they don't understand, um, make meaning from what they have read together. And so it gives them a space to engage around text in a really active and very social way, which is nice as well. Um, so when we think about the Common Core and we, we're thinking about reading and flipping reading and how to engage students around reading, some of the, the things that we're targeting in terms of the Common Core is there's a push for students to be reading independently. So a lot of times students read as a class, they get a lot of modeling from teachers and help from teachers, but and once they get to college, college and career, right, they're doing a lot of independent reading. So they need to cultivate independent reading skills. Um, they need to be able to close read, right? They need to be able to actively read a text. Um, they need to determine explicit and implicit meaning, which is hard to do if you're just reading a text allowed as a class and they have a very short amount of time to, you know, kind of understand the text, to think about the, the vocabulary and the, the meaning, the deeper meaning of the text. They need to be able to, un, you know, define unknown vocabulary, use context clues to try to figure out words they don't know. They need to develop, you know, think about the development of characters or, or people, events and ideas over a stretch of time or over an entire text. And so some of these things are really hard to do if students are trying to get it done just in the classroom alone. But they're also complex skills and so the more we can support them by connecting them to their peers outside of class and engaging them with their, around the text, the better. I also don't hear a lot of discussion about flipping images, right? Whether it's photographs or artwork, really complex flow charts and graphs. Um, I'm a big fan of infographics, which are becoming very popular online. Infographics are kind of this visual representation of research. 
But, you know, my husband's a history teacher, and whenever they hit a new time period, he will show pictures of artwork from that time period. But he does it as he's kind of lecturing. And I just wonder how much students get. How much do they observe, like, what do they understand, the nuances of what they're seeing? Do they, are they thinking about the art movement that this is coming from? Whereas if they can look at some of these things at their own pace, on their own time, would they get more out of them? I think that they would. Um, and there's a few places I like to go to grab images. One is nationalgeographic.com, not only for images, but also for video. It's a great resource, whether you teach science and you're looking at weather patterns, um, or if you're doing history and you're looking at a particular cultural group, lots of really dynamic images that you can flip. Also, Time, Life, Life Magazine, life.time.com, um, is Life Magazine. And anything that you're studying that really um, pertains to like the mid-1930s to now, uh, you can find really interesting articles, great photography. I was working with a teacher who's teaching 1112 at my school, and she was teaching um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, but her kids weren't that engaged in the story. And I said, really? They're not into like the mental war? They don't think that's interesting or fascinating? And she goes, yeah, I just haven't found found a lot of stuff that I can use to kind of get them interested in that. And so I did a search on life and I found this great article about life inside a psychiatric ward in the 1930s um, and she used it. And a lot of the kids were all of a sudden really interested in, well, why did they use this kind of treatment? Um, this seems kind of barbaric. Why would they do that? How have things changed? And she said the whole momentum around the book changed once they had some visuals and they had a sense of what life inside of a, a mental ward was like at this time period. So figuring out how we can use images to really engage students. Um, again, I love infographics. I think they're, they're so visually interesting, um, and, and people are producing them all the time. I try to grab them and use them in what I'm doing with my own students, um, and visually is a great place to kind of check out different infographics and see what's available. Um, so when we were doing Of Mice and Men, we were talking about mental illness, we were talking about um, crimes committed by people who are mentally ill and how that's been handled, and I found some really dynamic infographics on those topics for students to explore. And they were so captivated by the images and the information, but I know if I had handed them an article where those things had been explained in writing, it wouldn't have been the same. It wouldn't have had the same impact on them. Um, I also love that there's so many online resources popping up. So whether you want students to do a national uh, a tour of the National Gallery of Art, or whether you want them to take a tour of the Smithsonian or the Louvre, right? They can take these online tours and see a great artwork. They can experience things, you know, that they couldn't because you don't you can't actually go to all of these places, particularly in California, which is fairly budget strapped. Um, getting out of the classroom can be challenging. Um, and so when we think about visuals, um, I think there's kind of an indirect benefit to teaching with visuals because really the Common Core wants students to be able to use visuals in their own work to convey complex information. They need to be able to use technology very flexibly and strategically, but if they've never had a chance to engage with dynamic information in the visual form, how are they supposed to be able to create visuals that are dynamic and interesting, right? So I think the more we can expose them to interesting graphics and graphs and images, the better in terms of preparing them for being able to create these things to use in their own, in their own work to convey information. And then of course we have our classic flip, which is the videos. And the videos, you know, they can be really anything from teachers recording demonstrations or teachers recording lectures or information that they really want students to have. Sometimes it's grabbing news clips or documentary clips to complement what we're doing in the classroom. One of the things, you know, when teachers are kind of, they talk to me about the flipped classroom, a lot of teachers, they don't want to record themselves, right? They don't want to spend hours in front of a computer like recording all of their lectures. And I always say, you don't have to create all of your own stuff, right? There's so much great information, ready to use content that's out there that you can grab from, particularly if you're new to flipping or you're just kind of just getting your feet wet and you wanna try it but you don't wanna commit to recording your own lectures. That's really where I started, was grabbing cool clips from places like, um, you know, I worked with other teachers who use uh, Khan Academy clips. I also grab stuff from places like history.com, which has really excellent um, kind of digestible, very short clips on different things. Um, and so I, you know, there's 
a, a series that I use with Maya Angelou when I'm teaching I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. That's her being interviewed and it's snippets and it's all tied to historical events, which is really interesting. Um, and whenever I teach a novel, I want to give students historical context. So being able to grab um, little documentary clips from history.com, flip it, ask students, okay, what, what are you learning from this clip? What does this tell you about the time period? How might this impact what we're reading? I also love PBS.org. It has a variety of really interesting videos. Some of them are, you know, even demonstrations where there's like visual models of things being broken down, which is kind of cool for science. So PBS.org is a great place to look. So before you start creating your own visuals, I would look there. I would also check out youtube.com slash teachers where basically teacher created content has been curated and it's been matched to the common core. So if you go to youtube.com slash teachers and you scroll down, I believe it's towards the bottom, you can actually search by your subject area, what you teach. So if I'm a math teacher at the high school level and I'm about to do a vectors unit and I'm like, hmm, I wonder what's out there on vectors. I can actually go to youtube.com slash teachers and see the whole playlist for vectors. And maybe I don't want to use any of it. Maybe it's not really my style or it's not communicated the way I want, but I'm probably, if I do want to create my own videos, I might learn a lot from watching a couple videos on vectors and, and, and realizing, oh, I like this or I don't like that. It's just a nice place to start. So before you invest a lot of time, I definitely encourage you to see what's already out there. And, and try to use as much of it as possible. Um, and when students are just listening to videos or watching videos, sure, they're listening attentively to gain you know, information or you know, specific knowledge about their subject area. Um, they do need to analyze different accounts of information. Um, but it's really what we're asking them to do around the flipped content. So how are we engaging them? That's gonna give us the best opportunity to hit the Common Core standards. So I just want to take pause for about a minute and let you get to the todaysmeet.com back channel slash, so the todaysmeet.com slash flip it, our back channel, and then just share. So are you using any media with students right now? Pictures, videos, whatever. Where are you getting it from? What resources do you like? So we're a, we're, we're a medium-sized group here, and it's always nice to just kind of crowdsource are kind of what we're doing that's working, where we're getting information. So if you go there, kind of just share a couple ideas of where you get information, and I'm actually gonna throw up that, um, that URL for the website, like I said that I was going to, while you guys share where you get media that you love. Oh, I love TED Ed. Okay, so perfect segue. <clears throat> Someone just shared that they love um, TED's. How many people love TED Talks? Oh my gosh. A big fan, I could get lost in TED Talks for hours. I use them with my students all the time. And so I was really excited last year when I found out that TED had an education initiative. And so it's ed.ted.com. And based, this was actually the first lesson I ever flipped from TED Ed. Um, I was teaching, we were doing poetry, and I wanted them to get a better sense of figurative language, metaphor, my students kind of struggle with it, it's a kind of abstract concept. But what's really interesting is what TED is doing is they're pairing people kind of at the top of their field with animators to bring the information to life. And so this particular lesson is actually the script was written by a poet and she talks about metaphors, but then the animation brings the metaphors to life. So all of these really you know, well-known metaphors 
are then depicted in this kind of cartoon animation. And what's nice is with the collection of videos that are being produced is there's already lessons attached, right? So you watch the video, there's what's called think questions, so there are multiple choice questions, there's short answer questions, and there are, some are already designed, you can add your own, you can use the ones they have, you can do a combination of those things. There's a dig deeper section, which I usually use as kind of extension activities, where they've watched the video, they've answered some basic questions, now I want them to do something with that information. And now there's even a discussion component to TED-Ed also, where kids can answer a question and talk with their peers. And as I've used it, now I, I'm, I'm flipping more of my um, videos I'm just finding on YouTube. So not only can you flip the videos that they've created, but you can also take any video from YouTube that you want, flip it, design a lesson around it, and use TED-Ed that way, which kind of opens up a whole new world of possibilities in terms of what you can flip. You can even create your own videos and then flip them and design a lesson around the video you've created. So TED-Ed is really flexible in that way. It's a really great tool, and I would suggest checking it out if you haven't already. So when we think about a flipping, I, I break down my lessons into three parts in terms of lesson planning. Because when you start to kind of adopt more of a blended approach to instruction, and flip classroom is definitely a strategy within blended learning, you have to start thinking about how you design lessons slightly differently. Because they're starting in one medium and they're extending into the other. So I usually begin with some kind of inquiry activity. I want to get them asking questions, maybe I want to access previous knowledge, I want them making predictions. Um, and then the second part, and this inquiry usually happens in the classroom, the second part is the transfer of information. So is this gonna be, is this gonna be something written? Is it gonna be a video? Is it gonna be an image or a collection of images? How am I gonna um, engage students around that information? And then the third component of my flipped approach is the student-centered activity in the classroom. Um, how am I going to get them applying the information, working collaboratively to produce something where they're connected with their peer group to make the learning more meaningful? So I wanna walk you through a very mundane example. So no matter what you teach, vocabulary is part of your world probably, right? So in science, it's like a whole other language sometimes learning all that language, all, all that vocabulary. In English, um, every week and a half, I introduce 15 SAT vocabulary words. And so when I first heard about the flipped classroom, I thought, I don't really lecture at my students very often. I don't stand up in front of them and talk for very long about anything. So I didn't know what I was gonna flip or what I should flip. And so when I started really think about, okay, what do I spend the most time talking at my students about? It was vocabulary. So every week and a half, I'm introducing 15 words. I would stand up at the front of the room. I teach six classes, um, and I have one of those transparency machines. You guys remember those? they get like 200 degrees, and I would stand up in the front of the room for like 20 minutes introducing 15 vocabulary words, and there's the kids who are right with me, they're writing really fast, they've got all the information down, and then there's the kids in the back who are like, hold on, you're going too fast, slow down, right? So this is constant like struggle to keep the kids who were with me kind of engaged and kind of not go too fast to lose the kids in the back, so it took a good 20 minutes. 20 minutes times six classes is two hours of my instructional time every week and a half I was spending in front of my classes just talking at them, right? So I thought, okay, I'm gonna try flipping my vocabulary. So what I do in terms of driving inquiry is I put students into groups of about four. I give them a handout or a piece of paper, and in that piece of paper are all of their vocabulary words used in context. I haven't given them any definitions, they don't know what the words mean, all they know is that the words that are underlined are their vocabulary words. And as a group, they have to write the word, each word, and they have to try to figure out what they think the word means based on how it's used. So again, I'm trying to get them to kind of play with language, right? Use the context clues. What do you learn from how this word is used in the sentence about what it might mean? So they make predictions as a group, and the conversations that they have in these moments are some of the most like interesting, exciting conversations I've ever heard about language. Um, and so once they've done this, they've made their predictions, then I have my own YouTube channel. I, I flip my vocabulary, I flip my writing instruction, my students know that they can go there and look at my videos, my parents know they can go there. Um, and what I typically do is I will record a video post it to my YouTube, students who have kind of subscribed to my YouTube channel get an email, so I always say, well just subscribe to the YouTube, you'll never miss a video. And then I use our online discussion space 
and I, I embed the video so that they can watch it there. And I pair the words with visuals to try to help my visual learners remember what they mean. So I have the word, the part of speech, the definition. I go through lots of examples as I'm recording myself going through the presentation. And then I have visuals. Students have to take 10 of the 15 words and they have to write a story. And you'll notice that that's a big, big hunk of writing. There's some problems, right? Paragraph breaks would be delightful. Um, but that's a nice teaching moment where I can kind of highlight those things. And then everything that's indented underneath that are replies from peers. So this person is getting immediate feedback, validation. Students are asking questions, making connections. So they take 10 of those 15 words and they try to use them to write a short story, a poem. Um, and clearly, I, I, know, I don't give them a length. I say, I want quality. I'm, I'm not going to give you a quantity amount that I'm looking for. But students enjoy the activity. And if they were just writing the story for me on a piece of paper to turn it in, I don't think I would get this kind of development in their writing. But because they know their peers are going to see what they've written, it's got to be good, right? They want it to be good. They're invested in the finished product. Then when they come back to class, after they've seen the video and taken Cornell notes and done the, they've engaged around it, they've written the story, they've read stories from other students, then I have the student-centered activity where they find synonyms and antonyms for the words. And I encourage them to use mobile devices if they have them. You only need a couple in a group for that to be successful. They can also grab dictionaries or thesaurus or whatever they need to find a good synonym and a good antonym for each word. Because really, I want them to start understanding word relationship particularly my kids who are on a college track and are going to be taking the SAT, there's all those questions that are like, this word is to this word as that word is to that word, right? So they have to start understanding the word relationships. And so it's nice to engage them in that way. For those of us who are using, um, I just use my computer, so I have a Mac, and with every Mac you built right in is QuickTime, right? QuickTime is all I use to record my, my videos. I have a, um, I use Google Presentation to create my um, backgrounds, and then I do the voiceover, and I just record a screen recording with QuickTime, and I upload it to YouTube. Very simple process. Um, when I first kind of started dabbling in the flipped classroom, um, I was using educreations.com, which is an iPad app that is free and super user friendly. Um, there's lots of, there's Show Me, there's lots of more complicated iPad apps you can use and pay for that do more stuff. But my philosophy on tools that do more stuff is they're kind of harder to use on the outset, right? You have all these bells and whistles you have to figure out, you have to learn before you can actually start using them. Whereas I uploaded EduCreations and I was literally like recording a little screen, um, recording in 40 seconds because it makes your iPad look like a whiteboard and then you can kind of you draw things, you can upload images to you know, dissect or model kind of the different parts of things. Um, so it's a really great app if you're interested in, in starting to flip your classroom but you want to use an iPad. I also like the idea of using something like EduCreations if your students have access to an iPad where they can explain concepts, they can diagram, they can do something on there where they can record to demonstrate their understanding of a concept. And then you have a collection of videos that you can kind of assess and review and see where kids are at on your own timetable. So EduCreations is nice because a teacher can use it to flip or students can use it to record explanations and demonstrate understanding in kind of a different way, which I like. Um, so just some tips for those who are kind of new to flipping um, that I, I would suggest, which is, oh my gosh, break it up. So a lot of videos that you find online, um, they're kind of long, right? So I was actually having students read an excerpt from um, a nonfiction piece, and I wanted them to watch an interview of the author being interviewed. Um, it was actually memoirs of a boy soldier, and then this, this gentleman was being interviewed. And the YouTube video is 26 minutes and just over that long. It's kind of long for my kids to sit and listen with rapt attention. So I used a tool called Tube Chop. And I chopped that video, I shortened it. Um, I basically started it a couple minutes in, and then I ended it at about minute 13. So they, I think they only watched about 10 or 11 minutes. But Tube Chop shortened the video. It gave me a URL to the shortened version. It also 
got rid of the advertisement, which I was really excited about. Um, so figure out how to break it up. So if you are gonna give them a piece of reading, maybe have them stop at a certain point and engage in the discussion, or stop at a certain point and add some notes to a shared Today's Meet back channel that, they are, that they're working on with other students in the class. Um, and if it's a video, use a tool like Tube Chop, make it shorter. You can also trim your videos on YouTube as well, so there are some YouTube tools you can use to get that done. Don't reinvent the wheel, right? There's so many people doing this that it's nice to just kind of do a search, see what's out there. If there's something great, then you don't have to spend your time making it. Um, a design student-centered activities. The more we can get students working together in the classroom to apply the information, the more incentive there is for them to do the homework, right? If we just flip to the classroom to make more time for things like worksheets or solitary tasks, I don't know if we're gonna grab as many kids. Are they invested in watching the video if that's what they're coming to class to do, right? So let's make class a really interesting, enjoyable experience. Um, let's get students creatively applying information and see if we can have fun with assessments. Can we use something like Socrative and do space races to see how much students retain from a particular video? Um, you know, could they be creating something as an assessment as opposed to you know, filling in a Scantron? And then I can never um, present on this topic without people asking, you know, like, what do you do if they don't do the homework? And I'll say this, flip classroom is not like a silver bullet of any kind, right? There's kids who just aren't gonna do the homework. They didn't do the homework before, they're not doing the homework now. Um, so you have to have a strategy to deal with students when they don't do the homework and they haven't seen the information because it makes it very hard for them to apply information that they've never seen. So I've, I initially started doing something kind of, um, I was a little labor intensive. I don't have technology in my classroom. I literally have the computer that's on my desk and a computer that was donated by the Santa Rosa Recycling Center. Um, all of the technology I leverage in the classroom are my students' devices. So I can't just set kids up in the back of the room with computers and let them watch the videos. Um, all of my videos are on YouTube, and of course my school filters are, uh, filters out YouTube. You can't see YouTube. We filter out everything fun. And then, um, so I was trying to find paper versions of the information that they had you know, watched or whatever at home, and then I realized that was taking more time for me to find actual kind of um, paper versions of the information that they had engaged with online. So then I was kind of putting them in the back of the room. I'm like, okay, read this, annotate it. And it almost felt like super punitive. So I thought, I'm not, I'm not enjoying the strategy. So we're in the middle of a Socratic seminar, which is when you have the students in the center having a conversation, you have an outer circle observing. And I thought, maybe I could use this philosophy, this kind of Socratic seminar strategy with kids who don't do their homework. So what I started to do was put my energy into making sure that the stuff that they were doing in the classroom was really interesting, really engaging, as creative as I could make it, very student-centered, and then the kids who hadn't completed the homework, they hadn't watched the video, they hadn't done the online discussion, I said, okay, you're going to observe these gr the, a group, you're gonna sit on the outside of kind of what they're doing, you're gonna take notes, what are you learning, what are they working on, what questions do you have, and all of a sudden, things started to change in terms of my homework turn and rate. Because there is nothing more painful for a teenager than to be sitting on the outside of what looks like kind of um, interesting activity and they can't take part, right? So all of a sudden, my like normal homework numbers, the percentage of kids who typically don't do their homework, started to shift. Now, more students do homework in the flip model than even on my traditional homework nights. Um, so I think figuring out what strategy you're gonna use that's gonna help you to kind of deal with these kids um, who don't do their homework, that's something to think about before you flip a lesson, just to make sure that you're not gonna create more time and work for yourself, um, but you're gonna try to incentivize students to do that work. And then my favorite part of the flipped classroom has nothing to do with what they, you know, the information that's online. It's more about what's happening in the classroom. So there's, really the magic happens in the physical classroom. Because as I said, my big, in, the, my big motivation for doing the flip model or embracing it was that I wanted more time, time with my kids to do cool stuff that we didn't have time for before. So that's where I think we can really drive higher order thinking, we can really start to address the common core, is with that time in the classroom. Getting them to go deeper, working together, um, 
there's more time for things like small group conversations and discussing um, issues and topics. So I love having breaking students into smaller groups and having them kind of go over a concept that they watched or read about and talk through it. I love having students teach students, right? So you consume something online and we, you, you, maybe you discussed it online. Can you now explain it to your peers in a way that makes sense for them? Also, figuring out how to pair them, right? So that students are supporting each other, um, they're problem solving together. I'm real big, obviously, love group collaboration, getting them to kind of apply information in creative ways, using devices to connect them to information in the classroom. I love getting more creative, right? As an English teacher at the high school level, ugh, man. Um, there's not always time for these kinds of activities. So that metaphor um, TED Ed lesson that I showed you, one of the extension activities that I had them do is I said, I want you to write a metaphor about your life. So they wrote just these one sentence metaphors about their lives, and then I had my TA copy and paste all of their metaphors into um, wordle.net, right, just to make a word cloud. And as each class came in, I projected the word cloud on my, my screen, and I said, okay, we're gonna write an extended metaphor poem about your life, where you take this one metaphor and you expand it. And then I told them we're gonna do poetry pinwheels. You're going to write your metaphor on a pinwheel, you're gonna, call, you're gonna um, paint it, and, and they created these pinwheels, and all of a sudden, it was like, the poem's going on a pinwheel? Like, this poem has to be good, right? And I never had time for this kind of creative, hands-on stuff, and my kids left this class just like beaming. Oh, I haven't done watercolor since kindergarten, I love my poem, I can't wait to take it home and show my parents, and I realized I didn't, I, just before the flip model, I didn't have time for so many of those things. When you think about science classes, there's more time for labs, experiments, getting students out of the classroom to do things like field work and observe life, right? There's more time to do those things. So if you have questions, this is not the best forum to ask questions necessarily. Um, you're welcome to throw them up on the back channel. I would, I'm, I'm gonna go through that. I'll make sure I answer anything you guys need to know more about. Um, and then if you wanna connect with me, I'm on Twitter, C. Tucker English. I also write an education technology blog where I talk about everything from tools and how I'm using them in the classroom to kind of bigger technology education issues um, that I'm kind of thinking about. And so you can post comments to CatlinTucker.com if you wanna know more about any anything that I presented today or other things that I'm gonna be presenting on. Um, I'm presenting on argument writing later where we're gonna do more of a hands-on deep dive into argument writing if you're thinking about how do I get that done in my classroom to address the common core. So thank you for being here. Have a wonderful Saturday. Um, and you know, catch me if you have questions after or just post into the back channel.